And listen to the choir sings, Jesus is Lord of all. Thank you, choir. Take your hymnals one once again, please. Page 515, stand with us since I have been redeemed. Page number 515. Where I shall live eternally 
seated, Pastor. Thank you, Brother Galloway. Good to see you all tonight. And uh, got uh, Reverend James Owenby with us here tonight. It's a missionary to Mongolia. And I'm glad to have him. I'll say more about him uh, after he's gone. No, I'll say more about him before he, <laughs> before he speaks. But, uh, so I'll leave it at that. But good to see each of you here tonight. And um, half decent crowd. I understand why some men are missing, but why are the women missing tonight? They're home watching the Super Bowl? Is that it? What? All righty. Well, listen, what we're going to do tonight is this. We're going to take our regular offering. So if you've got your tithe to throw in or something like that, then go ahead. If you got to, uh, want to contribute to Brother Owen being his ministry, and I highly recommend that you do, and it's a good, uh, good investment of your mission's dollars, uh, we'll take an exit offering at the end of the service. Gentlemen, you come. So uh, the Reverend's got uh, a nine-minute video presentation. <clears throat> and uh, James, why don't you put your money away? And uh, don't worry about this offering. We'd like to we'd like to help support you if we could. Uh, but uh, anyway, he's got a nine-minute offering, a uh, video presentation that uh, Lieutenant Ben has already got all queued up and ready to go. And then he's going to do whatever he wants to about that after that, preach a little and tell us a little bit about the field and everything. So uh, I'm looking forward to it. I'm thrilled that he's here. Father, we thank you. We love you. Thank you for bringing your servant here to be with us tonight, to minister to us, and God, just to fellowship with us. We thank you for it. Now, we pray you bless our offering, and God, thank you for everything you've done for the Pioneer Baptist Church. God, uh, that you use the Pioneer Baptist Church. We're honored with that. And God, thank you for the salvation that you've given to us, and a whole bunch of us here, while we weren't born into this particularly, some nobody's born into it except by the new birth, but uh, some were raised by good godly parents and, and others were raised by good parents that didn't understand the gospel. And God, for, for those of us that are in that condition, we're, well, seems like we're especially blessed and, and beat the odds like crazy to get saved. <clears throat> God, we thank you for that. And it has enabled us to raise our children in a true faith in Jesus Christ. And what a blessing that is, and we thank you for that tonight. So God bless our offering, and again, we'll say a little bit more about Brother Owen B in a minute. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, ladies. Take your hymnals one last time, please. Turn to page 118. Stand with us. His name is wonderful. Page 118. Master of everything. 
Things a little order out of order here today, so Lyle, you're going to come sing for us, right? We're an anchor for those who are hurting, a harbor for those who are lost. Sometimes it's not always easy bearing Calvary's cross. We've been ridiculed by those who don't know him And mocked by those 
who don't believe Still I love standing up for my Jesus Cause of all that he's done for me And that's why I am not ashamed of the gospel the gospel of Jesus Christ. No, I am not afraid to be counted, and I'm willing to give my life. See, I'm ready to be all He wants me to be. I'll give up the wrong for the right. I am not ashamed of the gospel. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus For every moment His hand has held mercy For all the love He's shown in my life A simple thanks just doesn't say how I'm feeling I get tears in my eyes So as for me I'm gonna keep on believing in the one who's been so faithful to me. I'm not out to please that whole world around me. I've got my mind on eternity, and that's why I am not ashamed of the gospel, the gospel of Jesus Christ. No, I am not afraid to be counted, and I'm willing to give my life. See, I'm ready to be all He wants me to be. Give up the wrong for the right. I am not ashamed of the gospel. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Oh, to some he's just a name. But to me, he's my, he's my everything. I am not ashamed of the gospel. I am not ashamed of the gospel. Too much behind me to let this world blind me to some. He's just a name, but to me, he's my He's my everything. I am not ashamed of the gospel. No, I am not ashamed of the gospel. And no, I am not ashamed of Jesus.
Thank you, Lyle, and thank you, Jan, for great music. Now it's my distinct honor and pleasure to introduce to you, what's his name again, James Owenby. Uh, Jim is a friend of mine of, I guess, 25 years standing. And we've done a lot together, been on great speaking tours in world famous cities like El Paso, where we participated in the five minute preach out for, for down there at Carlos Demarest, one of the great soul winners ever. And we went down there together and had a great time and have just uh, done everything you can imagine together. He substitute taught here, his wife taught here for a long time. And uh, just been a great friend. And like he said, I like the F U N, the fun and fundamentalism. And I like that too. I don't think we ought to, he says, I'm not suffering. A, how do you say it, Jim? Uh, I'm not just enduring, I think he said. I'm not enduring, I'm enjoying it. And there's a message there, isn't there? You know, a lot of fundamentalists are walk around mad at everybody all the time and never happy. Let me tell you something, that's a waste of a good life. Amen? So uh, I'll tell you, he's a great guy, he's a smart guy. High degree of intelligence, and he's a great speaker. He's all of that. But I've been thinking a little bit about him uh, in the, what, 36 hours that I've known he was coming. Thanks for the advance warning, Brother Owenby. Um, I'll tell you this. Out of the people I know, I would say people I know have heard of, but that would be a little more vague, so I'll be much more specific. Out of the people that I know, I have never known a man to be more persistent in serving Jesus Christ than Jim Owenby. You know, the uh, father asked his uh, son one time after they got out of church, he said, how'd you, how'd you like the sermon? And the kid said, well, the pastor missed three good opportunities to stop. A whole bunch of Christians out there looking for a good way to get off the ride. The preacher offends them, something goes wrong, they get insulted at church or anything, and guess what they've done? Well, I'll tell you this without saying any more. Brother Ombi's had plenty of chances to become discouraged. And he has never, ever, ever backed off from his service to Jesus Christ. And now he's out here in out of Mongolia. Okay? And he's been there for 10 years, I believe. So I'll tell you this, honestly, all the way, sir. Airborne, he's an extra... Uh, all American squad, the, the, um, uh, double A's, what are they? Airborne, whatever. 91st, the All American squadron. And he says the screaming eagles are just a bunch of what? Just a bunch of rookies. It's the All American. But anyway, I, I'll tell you, I'm proud to know you, Brother Ornby, and, and honestly, what I say about you hanging in there and getting the job done when, um, mere, mere mortals, and I say that jokingly, but, uh, a lot of people just would have dropped out. But he's kept going and is a greatly successful uh, missionary. And Brother Fisher down there in uh, Lemon Grove or wherever he is, south of us down the San Diego area, uh, in a week and a half or so, he's going to award him with his doctorate. And I'm proud of you, Brother Ombi. So why don't you come and take over the service and do whatever you want. I want you to have liberty up here. And God bless you. I'm glad to have you here. Good to be here. Amen. Amen. And so forth like this, brethren. Brother Smith will pick up on that. He remembers Brother, brother uh, Joe Hill. And so forth like this, brethren. So, can I ask you all to do me a favor before we start? Uh, if you can, I know Brother Smith had his knee replaced. Could you move up a little bit? That way I won't have to yell quite as loud. Just get up out of your seat and move forward. Stand, sit up here. That way I won't have to yell quite as bad. Uh, brother Mitchell was going to put one of those, uh, those headphones on me. And I said, no, I'd rather use the pulpit mic. I, uh, my wife missed an opportunity here. She's Asian, and she could see some of the folks that are here. Uh, praise the Lord. That's right. I was at another church this morning, and the preacher asked me, he said, uh, are you going to watch the Super Bowl? I said, what do I want to go see a bunch of drug-induced idiots for? Yeah, you... <laughs> Tell us how you really feel, right? <laughs> Praise the Lord. It's good to be in church. Amen. Good to be saved. Good to have a Bible. Amen. If you got a King James Bible, turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 
If you don't have a King James Bible, sit next to somebody that does or pick up that hymn book. It'll be better than whatever you got. I am so glad that I've got my own personal copy of the Word of God. When you get there, say amen. Okay, well, Brother Mitchell's there. It's good to see some old friends. That didn't. I hope that didn't come out like it, it sounded. Brother Mike, Julia, Steve, Pam, Billy. Oh, oh, it's good to see some folks still sticking by the stuff. You're a blessing to me. You're an encouragement to me. Brother Mitchell said I was an encouragement to him. You're an encouragement to me. See people still sticking by the stuff, man, because a lot of them that are quitting. A lot of them. We've been in some of the churches in the South, and it's just, oh, I don't even want to go there. Uh, but we've been on the field for about 10 years now. We've got two national pastors down in the Gobi Desert. How many of you know where Mongolia is? Okay, it's in between Russia and China. We're landlocked. Don't have a lot of water, so don't have a lot of humidity. But we've got eight months where it's 40 below zero. Now, Brother Sam Gipp says, the Lord has either got a sense of humor or he's blessing James's ministry to send a guy from Southern California out to a place where it's 40 below zero for eight months out of the year. So I like to think the Lord's got a sense of humor. Uh, but uh, the Lord's blessed us. We've seen some folks saved there. Got a couple of churches started. And uh, two years ago, we started a third ministry where we move around with the herders in the little gear, the little felt tent. And uh, we're there as English teachers. Uh, and guess what we use as our textbook? Amen. Our King James Bible. Amen. Uh, now, it's not like China. We don't have to hide. We don't have house churches where we have to hide. Uh, and I don't get a lot of harassment there. President Bush came over in 2006. He's the first American president to visit Mongolia. And the Mongolians still are one of the few Asian nations that still respects America. They still think we're a Christian nation. Okay, they got a lot to learn, but at least they know they have some respect for us. Um, and when we go there, we teach English to the police force, to the nurses and doctors. We're in the schools. I can go into the nursing ho the uh, uh, hospitals and things over there. Uh, the reason that I'm back here, my dad had a stroke last year. He's 84 years old. And uh, my mom called and said, you better get back here and, and, and help your dad out. And I turned to my wife and I told my wife, I said, uh, my, they put my grandmother in a nursing home. And my wife looked at me and she said, what's a nursing home? Because in Mongolia, they don't have those. The children requite the parents the way they're supposed to. So if I didn't come back to help my dad, she would have been on the plane with the visas and the passport, and she would have came back here. So they're back in South Carolina. My wife, my three children, and my mother-in-law are back in South Carolina at Lighthouse Baptist Church in Interree, South Carolina. They've got a missions house there. They've got an ACE Christian school. They put my children in the school back there. When my mother-in-law got off the airplane, now remember, she's a goat herder from the Gobi Desert. And we took her into the missionary supply store, uh, Walmart, okay. <clears throat> and we got in, and she saw 25 different kinds of coffee and 18 different kinds of shampoo and fruits and vegetables, and she was almost crying. She was back in the car almost crying. You know, we don't realize how good we got it here. And, uh, and uh, she's, uh, she called my sister-in-law a week or two after that. She got an international calling card and called her up, and she said, I'm in paradise. Okay, so she's, uh, she's still in shock, but she is one of the sweetest people I have ever met. Uh, her husband died when my wife was four years old, and uh, she's raised five children by herself. She's done a fantastic job. She's just as sweet as she can be. She's always got a good attitude. She's always willing to help. I've never seen her get mad or angry or upset or something that she can't do with a family. So she's been a real blessing to us. So I asked the Lord to give me the money to help get her over here so she could see America. First time she's ever been out of the country. And a lot of the things that we take for granted, she has seen in a magazine, and now she's getting a chance to see them firsthand. So I led her to the Lord four years ago. And uh, my wife's brother got saved, and her sister, and she's got two other sisters we're still praying for. So put that on your prayer list. Let me show you my presentation. And uh, please pay attention to the words and what's being said and what I've got up here. Uh, there will be a test when it, we get done, okay? He walked along the 
Jesus came to save.
I was saved in this year. Uh -huh. Thank you very much for sending to us, James. We have learned a lot of things about Jesus Christ. That's what she said. Cinema said there at the end. So did you see the, uh, the cow with the blankets on it? Now, there's a reason that I did that. The Mongols don't have a lot of wood to build barns. They will lose about 40% of their livestock every year because of the weather. So the next best thing is to put blankets on the animals. So I said, if I tell an American they're putting blankets on horses and cows, and uh, if you've been from the countryside, Brother Lyle will tell you, I said, most Americans will think I was exaggerating or lost my mind. So I told my wife, I'm going to put that slide in there so they can see that that's the only thing they can do is put blankets on the animals. So, Did you see my Mongolian pickup truck? The camel with the car... They use camels and yaks. That's their tractor and their, their uh, work truck, okay, over there in the countryside. So um, maybe somebody's got a quick question. I'll, uh, I'll stay after church and, uh, and answer all the questions you want. I'll talk as long as you will. My wife says sometimes I talk too much. You know, usually if she's with me, she's sitting in the back of the church, you know, doing one of these. So. Somebody got a question about the country. We've got uh, uh, some harsh weather, but uh, uh, how many of I know Brother Lyle and, and uh, Brother Mitchell and some of the others. I know y'all have, how many of you, uh, the other people have eaten at a Mongolian barbecue restaurant? Okay, you go ahead and raise your hand. The pastor ain't going to get mad. Okay, the Mongols don't eat that. That's an American's idea of an overglorified Chinese stir fry. The Mongols eat a little bit of uh, uh, flour with the meat inside of it, almost like chicken and dumplings. They call it boats. They squeeze it together and steam it. Uh, they can't grow a lot of vegetables because the ground's frozen most of the year. Uh, they can grow some potatoes, some rice, some uh, carrots, little short fat carrots that look like a little rutabaga, and that's about it. The summertime, they can import some cucumbers and tomatoes, but for the most part, they don't want any vegetables. The, uh, my wife, we went to the capital city. Uh, we usually go up there to get stuff like mustard and spaghetti and stuff once every couple of months. And uh, my wife put some beans and some corn and some stir-fry rice one night, and her uh, brother is a captain in the Mongolian army, and he took two bites of that, and he looks at her and he goes, what do you put this junk in here for? You know, they just don't want it. So they're not used to it. Yes, sir? I'm curious as to how they maintained uh, their independence. Well, in night, uh, uh, Mongolia was under Soviet domination longer than any of the other uh, former satellite countries. Stalin came in in 1921 and ran the Chinese out. Okay, and then when Soviet communism collapsed in 1991, the Russians just got on the train and went back home. So they got their independence or, or became a, a, a parliamentary uh, uh, democracy in 1991. Now, they've been struggling ever since. Um, the Americans are trying to tell them how to do things one way. The Russians are trying to tell them how to do something another way. The, uh, the Europeans are trying to tell them to do something. I wish they'd just get out of the country and let them figure it out on their own. You know, so, but they've got uh, a regular... Uh, 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 parliament uh, that they elect a representative from their IMAG uh, and they've got a president uh, so but they're struggling a little bit but they'll get there so China sir China no 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 they, they know that Russia's at their back so the Chinese come over they're not gonna they're not gonna bother them um, most of the uh, middle-aged and older Mongolians we can get to them with the gospel many of the younger people are not interested in anything spiritual if they tell you they're Buddhist because our culture is Buddhist, 
It's kind of like some of the Yankee Catholics. My dad was a Buddhist and my granddad was a Buddhist and that kind of thing. Most of them know very little about Gautama Buddha. But they hate the Chinese. The Chinese and the Mongols have a, a, a hatred for each, each other. So what the Lord gave me a couple of months ago was this. I tell the young people that I'm trying to talk to that Buddhism came from China. And it did. So, but that, that gets it. They start listening. They start thinking, you know, when we do that. So. We don't have any, any uh, problems at all preaching the gospel there. We can preach on the street. We can pass out gospel tracts because of your prayers and your support. We've got two churches there. I've got two national pastors in place. We've got a third ministry where we're moving around with our gear, our little felt tent uh, with the herders. And I love being out in the countryside with the herders. Okay, the weather doesn't bother me. I, I, uh, I can handle that weather because it doesn't have the humidity. And the whole country is 4,000 feet or higher. You're on a plateau. So... Uh, and even in the summertime when it's 90 degrees, you'll see the guys with long sleeve shirts and stuff to keep them getting sunburned. So, but they're, uh, they're very curious. Most things, uh, Microsoft is all in English, finance is in English, so everybody wants to learn English. So we teach English in the schools, uh, and we went in to teach the police chief, uh, and the police chief said, James, would you take that Jesus thing into the prison? And I was like, wrote in the book of Acts, I, wanted, I said, uh, what did you say? And he said, would you take that Jesus thing into the prison? I said, well, sure, that's what I came here for. Why would you ask me to do that? And he said, if you don't go in there and change those men's lives with the gospel, he said, when they get out, they're going to be a worse problem for me than when they went in. Now, raise your hand if you've ever heard another missionary say that a former communist police chief asked him to take the gospel into the prison. And because of what the Lord accomplished in that first prison, the warden brought in the TV people and the radio people and, and made a, did an article they put on TV about it. And that warden got us into two other prisons. So, I mean, the, the country's wide open. I just need some help. If I'm there another 50 years, I'm not going to reach everybody. there. That country's as big as the state of Alaska. And they're spread out all over the place. So it, it's a very rough country, and I can't get to all of them. So how many of you take a vacation every year? Brother, don't look. I don't want them to get mad. Uh, yeah, raise your hand. Go ahead, Mike. I said, okay. It's okay. Listen, would you pray about maybe coming to the mission field and working with a missionary? Not necessarily us, but I'll guarantee you it will change your life. Some of the young people, I'm glad to see some young people here. They're all into video games and iPods and everything else. You know, they want to be radical dudes and all that kind of thing. I'm going to tell you something. You get on the mission field, that'll be a radical dude. Okay? Serving the Lord, I will guarantee you. It'll be a life that you will remember. What else can I tell you about Mongolia? Any questions? Yes, sir. Yep, that's good. But how many of the, of the cults are there? Okay, we've got the JWs and the Morons and the, and the, the Muslims are starting to come into the country uh, a little bit. They're all there. Um, they've got one of the largest Catholic church buildings I've ever seen. It's bigger than that monstrosity in New York City. And uh, they tried to open it in 2004, and they've got a 70-foot false ceiling in that thing. And they brought the Mongolian building inspector over, and it was a lady, and she went up there and fell 70 feet to her death. And uh, they wouldn't let them open the building. Okay. Now listen, because they're very superstitious, you know that that's a bad omen. So they they just let them open it last year. Okay, so yes, all all the the usual dummies are over there. Let me tell you what what our if you want to pray specifically, uh, there we have two problems over there. The first one is Americans with money and influence. Now, Jim, what do you mean by that? How many of you have heard of the martial arts guy Steven Seagal, and and the the actor Richard Gere? Those are both two big time Buddhists. Okay, Gear is personal friends with the Dalai Lama, and they both come over to Mongolia, and because of their Hollywood influence, they go to the parliament and they tell the parliament, get those Christians out of here. They're the ones that's destroying your culture. Now, you can know, you can imagine how that looks for uh, uh, the Mongolians to see two Americans at odds with each other, and we're supposed to have the truth. So the second thing I have a problem with is these charismaniac nuts, you know, the Benny Hens with their tents and everything. They come over in the summertime. They won't come over when it's cold. But the problem is, uh, you see, we're gospel saturated in America. The Mongolians have only had it for 10 or 15 years. And when the, these, these charismatic guys come over and they use the same terminology that we do, they say the same Bible, the same God, the same Jesus, all it does is confuse the Mongols. And they don't understand that that guy that somebody touched his leg and he got up off the road, they don't understand he's been paid. Okay, so they don't know that the guy's been playing a game. So I wish they'd just get out of the country. If any of you have any friends that are in Al-Qaeda or whatever and they want to blow up an airplane, maybe you could find the next one that Gare's going to get on. Or, or maybe it's like, oh, I didn't say that, brother. Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. 
Any, that's what I was told at the church I was at this morning. Anything you say can and will be used against you in a court of law. So, Any other questions about, about Mongolia? Yes, ma'am. They have television. In the capital city, they have some of the modern conveniences. They have taxis and buses and stuff like that. They have some shops there. Uh, back in 2003, they tried to open up a McDonald's. And, you know, McDonald's is a franchise. You have to w follow their orders. You have to do exactly what they say. Well, the Mongols wanted to put some of their own food on the menu, and McDonald's said no, so they, they basically left the country. Okay, they won't do it. So I saw the, <clears throat> the Golden Arches. You know, it didn't say McDonald's. It said Monburger. You know, so they, they're still trying to sell hamburgers and stuff. So um, they're starting to get some hotels in. They have some mining interests there. They're trying to mine copper and silver and gold and stuff. The minerals are there. It's just difficult to get them out of the ground. The Chinese call the Mongolians a poor man sitting on a mountain of gold. Okay, because they know the, the resources are there. They just can't get to them. So. If you like to read, uh, there is a book that is published by a man named Jack Weatherford. He's an anthropologist. He's the only Westerner that has been allowed into the country of Mongolia and has translated the secret history of the Mongols into English. And he published a book, and the title of the book is Chinggis Khan and the Making of the Modern World. It's a little short book. You should read it. It's really interesting. We were taught that Chinggis Khan was some bloodthirsty, cutthroat, and killed, and, and, and maimed. Everything. He wasn't like that. Okay, Entirely different from what we were taught in the West. So it's a pretty good book. Okay. Yes, sir? Yes, sir? In, in that environment where it's 40 below zero and average for eight months out of the year, that kills a lot of the viruses and the bacteria. They don't have a lot of that, that kind of problem. What most of the Mongols die from is kidney and liver disease because they don't have good water. Uh, hygiene is virtually unknown. They'll go out and mess with the animals and come in and start fixing food, okay, and won't wash their hands and stuff. So that, that's a problem. Um, I don't mean to gross out the ladies, but... In Mongolia, when a lady gets ready to have a child, they don't wait until she dilates. They'll take four or five nurses and push the baby out. Okay, so they, use, they lose women and children every year. My son was born that way, and my wife almost couldn't walk for two weeks. And we, uh, when she got pregnant with the girls, the Filipino midwife that we were going to use said, you had better not let your wife have a natural birth or it could cripple her for life. So we did a C-section for both of the girls. It's a, it's a little different environment. We went into the hospital and I saw some instruments there that were not sterilized and they had some stamps on them, 1932, 1936, you know, they're still using that kind of stuff. Now we have doctors from America and Europe that come to Mongolia every year and they teach them proper medical procedures, but as soon as they leave, they go do, right back to doing it the same old way. They say, that works for you in your country, this works for us and ours. So they, they're, they're very pig-headed. And I like pork. <clears throat> okay. Any other questions about the country? They don't. That's why I say most of them die from kidney and liver disease. They don't get a lot of the vitamins and minerals that they need from that. They sure do. That's right. Yep. They don't get a lot of it. Now, beef is a winter meat. They do have some cows over there, but they only kill the cows in October once a year. So what our family does is we buy like half a cow and we store it. Uh, during the winter time, and we've got a lady that's got a hand grinder, and she grinds up some of the meat and makes some hamburger for us. So, uh, but my wife, uh, you know, the Lord puts the right people together. My wife likes to cook, and I like to eat. Okay, and she cooks Mexican food and American food and Korean food and Chinese food, and she loves experimenting. So she actually cooks very little Mongolian food. She cooks mostly Western food and and uh, some of the other Asian foods. So I haven't taught her. She hasn't learned how to make Filipino food yet, but. I took her down and, and got her some Vietnamese soup, some pho bo bien. Oh, she likes that. She enjoys that. So she, she's going to learn how to make that when she gets back. So. Any other questions? Yes, sir. You got a question? Okay. Cool. I'm sorry? How, from the capital city? Uh, one of my churches is about 240 kilometers southwest, uh, the uh, one in Chur, where you saw the Soviet airplane. The other one's about 130 kilometers east of the city, okay? And uh, so we can get to the capital city about, it'll take us about three, maybe three and a half hours to get there. If I'm at my closest church, my other church, it takes us about six hours to get there. So you saw my, my camel. Mongolia is the only place in the world that has a two-hump camel. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Yes, 
No, I've had people ask me that before. Is it Russian? Is it Chinese? No, it's Mongolian. Okay, they speak their own language. Yep. Now, now the script, the old script, looks like looks almost like Arabic. But when Stalin came in in 21, he did away with that, and he went to the Cyrillic script, which is what the Russians use. So they love the Russians. They think the Russians are the greatest things that slice bread, you know, because the Russians did a lot for their infrastructure. Okay. Um, my wife told me that when she was growing up, she was taught that Reagan was a bad man. Okay. Now, she's learned different now, but that, that, that was their view uh, of America. So, but there, things have changed. Praise the Lord. So, uh, you saw the slide where I was standing with the three other people, at the, and it said the English language Olympics. They bring in the Gobi students from the Gobi Desert once a year, and they have an English language Olympics. And because I speak English, Southern English, they, uh, uh, somebody asked me, he said, Jim, are you teaching them that Southern English? I said, that's the only kind I know. Okay, what else you want me to teach? So anyway, uh, I'm one of the judges, so I get to, to judge the, the English language. And the fellow that was standing in that picture, uh, that was uh, the second one over from me, he was a former Soviet KGB officer there in the village that we went into. And I mean, had the big shield and the dagger through it and everything. And he knocked on my door one morning, and he came in and sat down. And in Mongolia, they give you some tea and something to eat, no matter what when you come. Okay, they're very hospitable. My wife thinks that Americans are so rude because you don't fix them something to eat when you come in the house. And I said, well, we'll do it if you ask them. But anyway, this guy comes in the house, and he sits down, and he says, James, you can teach English here. You cannot teach Bible. If I catch you teaching Bible, I will deport you. I said, no, you won't. I've got my green card, my Mongolian immigration. Your government knows full well what I'm doing. I'm not leaving until God's done with me. God called me here. God will tell me when to leave. And he said, well, who's in charge of your agency? I said, Jesus. He said, no, 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 here, here, here in, in, in the country, who is in charge? I said, I don't have an agency. I'm an independent Baptist. You know? And he said, uh, well, uh, how many people go to your church? I said, I, I'm working with goat and sheep herders in the Gobi Desert, dude. I don't keep people's names. Whoever wants to come, comes. He said, well, how much money have you got in the bank? I said, I'm a Baptist. I don't have any money. He said, um, well, I want you to, uh, to uh, do a write-up for me and come to my office and tell me what all you plan on doing. I said, listen, I'm here teaching your people to obey the law, to do what's right. I'm not here being a troublemaker. I'm, not, I'm trying to teach them, stop stealing and lying and drinking and everything. And he said, uh, well, come to my office. I still want you to give me a write-up. So I did. I gave him, a, I typed him up a little thing to tell him what all we were doing. And uh, he looks at this thing and he goes, uh, what's this humanitarian aid? I said, that's giving people clothes and food, man. Come on, you can figure that out. You know, normal words to us just confuses them. So he didn't know what this humanitarian was. So then he said, uh, you cannot teach Bible here. If I catch you teaching Bible, I'll deport you. I said, dude, give it your best shot. I said, okay, I've got my Mongolian green card. The, the government has approved me to be here. I said, you're talking to the wrong guy. You're not going to intimidate me. But I guess he intimidated some other people and ran them off. He's trying to run me off. I said, it ain't going to work. So that was about four years ago. So a couple of years later, this same Soviet police officer now becomes the Somme governor. All right, And I was at the, the uh, uh, English language Olympics, and he had his back turned. And I walked up to him, and I tapped him on the shoulder. And he turned around, and he goes, James, you're still here. I said, so are you. <laughs> and we became good friends. And uh, he, uh, he told me, he said, if you need any help with anything, come see me. I'll try to help you out. So the Lord turned that relationship around, and now He's there trying to help us. So I wish, I really do wish that you would pray about coming to the mission field, and if you could help us, I'd appreciate it, because we need some young folks out there, and I'll never reach it. If I'm there another 50 years, the Lord grants me another 50 years, I'll still never reach everything there. So, And, I mean, it's wide open. The opportunity is there. And if we don't get in there, the cults will. They'll get in there and, and, and make a mess of things. So, We did have a couple of people that left one of our churches, and... Um, they had been exposed to these charismaniac nuts who did faith healing and tongue speaking and all this trash. And I had been teaching our people that the apostolic signs had ended and that was not for the New Testament Christians. And they got mad and left the church and went all over that IMAG telling everybody we were a cult. We were teaching against the ministry of the Holy Spirit. So we, we have our, our uh, they have their games there like you do in America. You know, so you're, we're having to fight some of that as well. So you have a question? Anybody? Any other questions? Like I say, I'll stay out here and talk as long as you will after church. I'll stay here and talk just as long as you will. So I've stayed up the last two nights talking with people and uh, kind of having an old home week. Brother Hofstra and Brother Jordan and I sat up till almost midnight the other night just talking and chewing the fat a little bit. So I like to talk. I'm a Baptist preacher. That's what I do. So, All right. No questions? Uh-oh. Here we go.
I, one of their head. Okay. The felt is about that thick, and they'll put about three layers of that on the tent, and they've got a little stove on the inside that they use either coal or camel dung to heat it up with. And after they set that gear up in about an hour, they'll have that stove going, and it'll be really, it'll be hot enough in there for you to uh, come down to your T-shirt. Sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Now, some of the more well-to-do people will have a little wooden floor they'll put in there. Okay, that, that, that's how you tell them uh, where your stature is, how, how well off you are in a community. you got a wooden floor. So, Yeah, the country Mongolians and, and, the, and the city Mongolians, it's just like here in people in the city and the country people in America, same thing. Almost the same attitude. They're very hospitable in the countryside. They're, they're, they're fun to be around and to talk to and they'll listen to you. Some of the people in the city, you know, yeah, I'll believe in Jesus. Now, what are you going to give me? You know, so I don't, I don't like hanging around those folks. You know, they've been, they've been uh, exposed to a lot of Western uh, propaganda. So they know that they're trying to get some money out of the guys. So, uh, Did you see the, the white-haired fellow that was in, in my uh, uh, display that was sitting kind of in the center of the church? His wife, Erdin Surin, was our first convert in that village, and she works for the Mongolian Telephone Company. And she started coming to our English classes, and then she started coming to church, and she got saved. And the first thing she said is, would you pray for my husband? And I said, well, by all means. And we started praying for him, and in about two months, he started coming to church. We gave him a Bible. We gave all the, all the new people that come in a Bible. And now she's got shift work, so sometimes she has to work on Sunday, and sometimes she's not there. Well, brother, even if she's not there, he is. I said, I don't see that in America. Usually if mom's saved and dad's not, if mom ain't there, dad ain't there, this guy's coming to church. And on Sunday morning, after I preach and give an invitation, I always leave about 20 minutes for question and answers. This guy has got one of these legal pads full of questions. Now that tells me two things. He's reading his Bible and he's looking for answers. So he started doing this for about six months. He's doing this, but he never would make a profession. And I got mad and I went over to his house one afternoon and I said, what's keeping you from getting saved? And he said, I've heard everything that you've taught and preached, James. He said, I just can't believe that a man rose from the dead. He said, I just can't get over the resurrection. I went to Corinthians, over 500 eyewitnesses in one gathering, several other scriptures, nothing worked. And about, oh, six months before we came on furlough, I get a knock on my door. And he comes in and he goes, I'm ready to trust Christ. And I went, again, like Rhoda, I want to make sure I heard him. I said, what did you say? He said, I'm ready to receive the Lord. I said, uh, you're ready to receive the Lord. Now, listen, in their society, since they have not been exposed to the gospel, America is gospel saturated. They're not. So I wanted to make sure that he's not just going to try to say a little prayer and add Jesus to all the other list of little idols that they worship. I said, no, Jesus is the creator of the universe and is the only savior from sin. Everything else is an idol. Okay, so when he said, yeah, I understand that. Okay, then I went over what sin is. Jesus is the savior. It took about 40 minutes, went through the scriptures. After he got off his knees from asking the Lord to save him, I said, Oh, Suchbar, what changed your mind about the resurrection? Now listen to what he said. He had a man that he went to school with, one of his classmates, okay, that had became a Christian through another ministry about two years prior. And he said before this guy's conversion, he was the worst drunk in the country. He said now you can't get around him with alcohol. He said before his conversion, he used to go down to the capital city and try to rip off the tourists every chance he got. Now he's trying to give back. For what he's done and he went he told me several other things that had changed in this man's life and he said there's something different and he said if Jesus did that for him I want him to do that for me Amen. now listen folks the reason I tell you that there are people in Southern California that will never darken the doors of this church they'll never open a Bible they'll never even take a gospel track but you know what they will do they'll watch you and you've heard the old saying if you were on trial for being a Christian would there be enough evidence to convict you hmm so what, what are they seeing in your life? So he saw something in this man's life that was different. And he went to school with this guy, grew up with him, knew him, and he saw a difference. What are they seeing in your life? I don't want to make you mad tonight, but I do want to encourage you a little bit so that you can enjoy your salvation instead of just enduring it. I see too many of our people, especially in our Baptist churches, and that's the only kind of church I go into, that look like they've been baptized in vinegar. I really do. I'm serious. You know, and, and, and their attitude is they think if I come to church on Sunday morning and give God a little time and open up my Bible for 15 minutes and throw a little change in the plate, I'm doing God a favor. Hmm? I, I've seen it. That's why we're losing the battle, guys. That's why the, uh, the country is going down the tubes. You know, in the book of Acts, when the disciples, okay, after the Lord went back to heaven, they stayed in Jerusalem. Okay, the Lord had to persecute them to get them to go out like he told them to. I believe that's what's happening in America. 
Okay, we're only less than one tenth of one percent of the Bible college graduates go to the mission field. We've got more preachers in the United States of America than every other country in the world combined. Okay, the Lord says go. Didn't in the first two letters of the gospel, didn't it go? G O, you know. What are you doing with what you've got? I tell this story all the time. And I was talking to, to Billy earlier. This is how the Lord used a man to get me to the mission field. Okay. Uh, Brother Lyle introduced us to Brother Carlos Demers. Brother Mitchell mentioned him earlier. Okay. And I ran into uh, uh, about five years ago, I was up preaching at, at West Coast, and I saw Brother Carlos's grandson, Seth, was up there. I didn't know he was there. And I had mentioned Jeff, his son. And uh, it, he used Jeff to, to burden me about going to the mission field. And Brother Mitchell remembers, we were sitting in this congregation, and the second day of the meeting down in El Paso, Brother Demers said, uh, Jeff, why don't you get up and, and talk to the people about uh, the mission field? Well, we thought he was going to say something about the country of Uganda, where Jeff was at. He didn't. He got up and started blasting the preachers. He started, he said, you know what, there are some of you guys that treat the church like a business. He said, your heart's not in it. You're not trying to encourage your people and grow your people. You treat the church, you're coming in punching your time card. He said, God's going to hold you responsible for the things he's given you. He said, I know people that are in wheelchairs are doing more to get the gospel out than some of you people that can walk. You remember that? And he said, I know some people who don't have the use of their arm and hands that will pass out a gospel tract with their teeth. He said, God's going to hold you responsible for it. Brother, I was almost crying. I said, I am not going to stand before God empty-handed. And that's when I told, I, I told Brother Schreier, I said, I, I am going to the mission field. I said, I knew that, that uh, Miss Bernie was going and taking Bibles behind the Iron Curtain. And I said, Lord, give me that kind of faith. I told him in a prayer meeting tonight, Brother Mitchell, we saw a sign over a Texas steakhouse that said, Texas tested, tried, and trusted. And I said, until your faith has been tested and tried, it can't be trusted. I said, Lord, give me the kind of faith that Roberta Bernie's got. Put me in a communist country someplace, and I started praying about it. I saw people going into Vietnam, going into China, going into Cuba. I had never heard of anybody going into Mongolia. So the Bible says there is safety in a multitude of counselors. So I started seeking counsel. And I started asking preachers. I said, hey, do you know anybody going to Mongolia? And the standard response I got was, James, where's Mongolia? So through a series of events, Acts 1-9 and Joshua 1-8 and 9, God called me to Mongolia, and, and he's blessed us. And I didn't go over on a survey trip. I just went and stayed. Okay, and the Lord blessed us. I went over as a single man and met and married my language teacher. Okay? The Lord had used her, had been preparing her for me before I got there because she had been teaching the Mongolian language to most of the missionaries that came in the country and every one of them witnessed to her. So two years before I got there, she got led to the Lord by some Korean missionaries. Might have been Brother Parks, one of his people, somebody witnessed to her. Okay, And she left that and she came to work with me building churches out in the Gobi Desert. Now, 10 years, if she had spent another 10 years, she could have retired with a pension. So her family thinks she's lost her mind. Okay, but her mom and her brother that got saved, they saw her dedication and her testimony, and that's what brought them to the Lord. So there's people that are watching you, believe it or not. You're the only church that somebody's going to see. So that's five bucks, Mike. <clears throat> Any other questions? Yes, sir. No. No, uh, now my mail, I've, I've got a mailing address there, and it's on my prayer card. I've got, I've got some prayer cards and stuff back here on the table. I didn't bring a big display board and everything, but uh, you can mail us uh, letters. Uh, one of the things that a missionary really likes is to hear an email or something from somebody saying, hey, brother, man, I, I, I hope things are going well. I'm praying for you. Just something. That means more than money. I mean, the finances pay the bill. Don't stop sending your money. But, you know, I appreciate people who communicate because you get out on the field, you know, out of sight, out of mind. Most people don't even communicate with you. Okay, and that means a lot. We get uh, Christmas cards and birthday cards and anniversary cards and stuff once in a while. Man, that means so much to my family. So uh, the support goes to my home church, and they take and they put it in an account there in, in the capital city. But they, they've sent me an ATM card, and what I can do is I can go to one of the banks there in the village that we live in, and I can get it out that way. So, yeah. uh, the uh, monetary system in Mongolia is called a tugrik. It takes about 1,300 of those to make a dollar. Okay. Well, Brother Mitchell didn't tell me how long I got, but like Elizabeth Taylor told her sixth husband, I'll try not to keep you very long. Okay. I'll, I'll, I'll go ahead and, and take some more of your questions after, after church, but I do want to read you something that my wife enjoys. If she was here, she'd, uh, she would usually give me the high sign. I just happen to remember this. Uh, the fundamental differences between men and women. When the bill 
comes for the food, Mike, Dave, and John will each throw in $20, even though the bill's only for $32.50. None of them will have anything smaller, and none will actually admit they won't change back. When the girls get their bill, out come the pocket calculators. Money. A man will pay $2 for a $1 item he needs. A woman will pay $1 for a $2 item she doesn't need because it's on sale. Bathrooms. A man has six items in his bathroom. A toothbrush, toothpaste, shaving cream, razor, a bar of soap, and a towel. The average number of items in the typical ladies' bathroom is 337. <laughs> a man would not be able to identify more than 20 of these items. Okay? Arguments. A woman has the last word in any argument. Anything a man says after that is the beginning of a new argument. <laughs> Amen, Arlene? The future. A, mo a woman worries about the future until she gets a husband. A man never worries about the future until he gets a wife. Marriage. A woman marries a man expecting that he will change, but he doesn't. A man marries a woman expecting she won't change, but she does. Men wake up as good looking as they went to bed. Women somehow deteriorate during the night. <clears throat> Offspring, okay, children. A woman knows all about her children. She knows about dentist appointments, romances, best friends, favorite foods, secret fears, and hopes and dreams. A man is vaguely aware of some short people living in the house. And here's a thought for the day. A married man should forget his mistakes. There's no use in two people remembering the same thing. Okay. Amen? Amen? Okay, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. I'll try to be very brief, but I do want to encourage you a little bit tonight. I want you to think. Now listen, Brother Fisher, my pastor, is always saying, why don't you invest your life in somebody else's life? Okay? The reason that I'm able to do what I do is because guys like Lyle Smith and Jerry Mitchell and others invested their life in my life. Okay? Whose life are you investing in your life in? Now I want you to see something here in 2 Corinthians. In the Old Testament, the nation of Israel, the Jews, did what they did in obeying God, the Mosaic law, okay, just like swallowing a pill, like going to the doctor, and the doctor says, take this prescription and do this and that and the other. There was no heart in it, okay? And when the Lord Jesus came to the earth, that's what he tried to teach the disciples. You missed it, okay? Now, in the New Testament, Paul says we serve the Lord for a different reason. And look what he says, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, look at verse 14. He says, for the love of Christ constraineth us because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. Now that word constrain is the same word that we use for straight jacket. Paul says, I am constrained to go out and tell people the gospel. I can't do anything else. Now Paul was a very learned man. He sat under the feet of Gamaliel, who was a great teacher of the law. Paul says, all of that stuff that pointed to me, my education, my experience and learning, if it points to me, it's not pointing to the Lord Jesus Christ. He said, I want to point people to the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm constrained to do that. Paul didn't go out and get beaten and, and shipwrecked and stoned and almost killed and everything else, okay, because he liked pain, okay? Paul says, I am constrained to tell people the gospel for the love of Christ. Look at verse 15. And that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. Folks, we don't get to get up in the morning and take our Franklin planters out and start seeing where we can fit God in for the day. Okay, you're bought with a price. Why don't you get up in the morning and instead of complaining and running through your routine, why don't you get up in the morning and pray and say, God, what can I do to put a smile on your face today? Listen, we, we need to quit giving God a, a laundry list of things in prayer. God knows what we need, doesn't He? Do you think anything really surprises God? So why are we telling God what I need? Why don't we pray for other people to be saved? Why don't we? 90% of our prayers should be praying and thanking God for what He's done for us already. The other 5 or 10% should be supplication for other people. Okay, If everybody would follow that example, okay, you'd get your prayers answered. But we treat God like a, a, a some kind of talisman, you know. I heard of a guy this afternoon that for 32 years, okay, had been pastoring a church. 
And his wife was dying, and he went out in the yard, and he says, God, you can't let my wife go. And God says, you've been running this thing by yourself for 32 years, and now you come to me? And he realized then, I have been running this thing. Why don't you let God run things? It'll be a major difference. Now listen, I am thankful that I've got my own personal copy of the Word of God. There are men that gave their lives so I can have my copy of this book. And we've got more respect for the TV guide and Sports Illustrated than we do for our Bibles. Hmm? We got too many people that know about the latest NASCAR stand-ins and where the Super Bowl is being played at and what our favorite Dodgers pitching averages are, okay, and what's on sale down at Belk and everything else than we know this book. I teach our people in the Gobi. They ask me, they say, why are we Baptists? I said, that's the name that was given to us by our enemies. Okay, we're Baptists because Baptists are people of the book. If you're saved when you get to heaven and Amos walks up to you and says, hey, did you read my book? What are you going to say? Oh, that's right. That's in the Bible. Huh? Ladies, we need to put down better homes and gardens and we need to put down all this other stuff and get interested in this book and start being the instrument that God wanted us to be. That's what we're here for. We're not to get up and get there and sit down and sit there. We're, we're an instrument that God wants to use. Now, God's, God is God. He could have used the Holy Spirit and saved anybody He wanted to, couldn't He, Mike? Huh? But He chose to use us. Do you know most Christians have never led somebody else to Christ? How many of you are glad you're saved? Huh? Why, why don't you tell somebody else? You don't have to be a Bible scholar. You don't have to know this book from Genesis to Revelation. It would be nice if you did, but you don't have to. Can you tell somebody else what happened to you? That's all you're expected to do. I don't see that the Lord Jesus put the disciples through four years of Bible college before He sent them out. I don't see Him calling doctors and lawyers. Who did He call? It's fishermen, common, ordinary working men. He sent them out. They're doing the job. What are we doing? I didn't mean to make anybody angry. I'm not trying to step on your toes. I'm trying to hit you in the heart. I'm trying to get you to see something. Okay, now listen. Anything in this book is important. Every word of this is a word of God. But when God re-emphasizes something over and over and over again, that tells me that's pretty important to the heart of God. Now, God's going to mention something here five times in three short verses. So I want you to see how important this is to God. Look at verse 16. Wherefore, henceforth know we no man after the flesh. Yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know we him no more. Verse 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ... He's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. I have people all the time ask me in America and in Mongolia, James, how can I know for sure I'm saved? I point them to this verse. What's changed in your life? Hmm? I don't mean this. I don't smoke and drink and chew and run with girls that do and all that. Kind of. That's you changing from the outside in. The Holy Spirit changes from the inside out. When you get saved, okay, He changes everything about you. Now, you'll still struggle with sin, but you'll dress different, act different, talk different, think different, listen to different music. Okay. I told Brother Mitchell, I want a copy of that CD with Lyle singing. That is some of the best music I've heard, but that's the kind of stuff we need. Okay, not this contemporary rot that's going around that's killing churches, okay? Music was originally intended for one reason and one reason only, to glorify God. Period. Brother Jordan taught us, he said, you know how you can tell what godly music is? He said, when the rhythm starts, if your foot starts tapping and you start swaying, he said, that is not godly music. He said, the rhythm should point you to spiritual things. Okay, so keep that in mind. You got that for free. Okay, now listen. Okay, what's changed in your life? Okay, what do they see? What, what kind of difference? Okay, when you get saved, the Holy Spirit comes to live inside. He's not going to let you do the same old thing. Is that right or not? He says, come out from among them. Be separate. You'll be that radical dude. Trust me. Especially in today's society in Southern California, okay? I'll guarantee you start living for the Lord. They're going to see a difference. They're going to say there's something radical about him. Hmm? Verse 18. And here it is. Pay attention. I tell my, uh, look up here. I tell my, my herders in the Gobi, look here. Look up. This means yes. Come on. This means yes. This means no. This means I don't know. So if you'll do one of those three while I'm speaking, we'll get out of here like Pastor. Okay? Verse 18. And all things are of God who hath, what's the next word? Say it. 
reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and hath given to us the ministry of, what does it say? Reconciliation. reconciliation. Now some of you English scholars, what does the word reconcile mean? To get two people that are at odds with each other together. We're supposed to get a holy, righteous God together with a lost, hell-bound sinner through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, is Paul talking to lost people or Christians here? I'm not trying to set you up. I'm not trying to trick you. He's talking to Christians. He said God has given to us the ministry of reconciling people. That's what every person sitting here, you're a missionary. Okay? Who are you a missionary to? That lady at Walmart, that guy down at the radio station, the people you see and work with, you're a missionary to them, to reconcile them. Okay, there's too many people that are in religion. Hmm? There's too many people in religion. Uh, religion, by definition, and I don't care what words you put in that little blank, okay, I don't care if it's Buddhism, Hinduism, Judaism, I don't care what it is. Religion, by definition, is man's attempt to get to God. Okay, I teach my folks in Nagobi, I say, listen, Christianity is not a religion, it's a relationship. It's God coming down it was religious people that put Jesus on the cross. We are not in religion. We are in Christ if you're saved. Big difference. That's what he says here. You're given a ministry of reconciliation. Verse 19. To wit that God was in Christ. What's the next word? Reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of? Reconciliation. 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 Recon you think that's important to God? Reconciliation. He's telling this church at Corinth, this was one of the most worldly churches Paul wrote to. He very seldom ever commended them for anything. He was constantly correcting and disciplining them because they had a problem. He said, you guys need to get up and get with the program. Hmm? That's an old military term. You need to get with the program. Okay? You need to start doing what God wants you to do. Put the books aside with Dr. Skeeter Whipple's 12-point program and all this other and how to feel good about yourself and just caring and sharing and hoping and coping and Max Lucado and all that other rot. I, I went going to some of these Christian bookstores and you all know, would be amazed at the swap that they got in there. Nothing in there to help people do the job God's called them to do. It's how to feel good about yourself. We have no righteousness. That's one of the first things I learned. We have no righteousness except the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the one that's righteous. We're not. That's what people need to see. We are not Christians, folks. Look up here. We're not Christians because we come to church on Sunday morning and dress nice and carry a Scofield Bible. We are not Christians because of what we do in here. We're Christians because of what we do out there. Okay, That's the difference. Jesus sent us out. Go out and tell folks the gospel. What's the gospel? It's the good news, but it's not the good news if it ain't the good news for you personally. Hmm? That's what the disciples were doing. Okay, verse 19, to, to wit, God was in Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ was God in the flesh, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them. Thank the Lord for that. And hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now pay attention, verse 20. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. How many of you have seen a, a, an ambassador before? Huh? When you see him on TV, isn't he kind of dressed up, suit and tie kind of thing? If you saw the American ambassador on TV in shorts and flip-flops and a tank top, what would you think? That's my ambassador? Now, the ambassador is dressed up, looks nice. Now, I, I'm not on clothing and dress. That, that's a, no, no, I, I'm not running down that rabbit trail. That's not my point. What I'm trying to say here is, what is our ambassador to the United States? What is he talking about all the time? What involved the United States? We're ambassadors for Christ. What should we be talking about all the time? Hmm? What should we be talking about all the time? The Lord Jesus Christ and the fact that He saved us from hell. Listen, folks, let me tell you something. There are people in our Baptist churches all over the place that think they're saved and they're going to die and split hell thinking they're saved. You know how I know that? Because that was my testimony. That's how I got saved. I made three professions of faith okay, before I ever got saved. Hmm? You don't just get to say that little prayer and take Jesus as a fire insurance policy against hell and then go out and live your life in your way. That is not salvation. And listen, I know there's a heresy running around that repentance is a work. Let me tell you something. Without repentance, you can't get saved. Then the Lord Jesus say, repent and believe. Huh? 
God will not change your heart until you change your mind about sin. It's that simple. That's all repentance is. A change of this, and God will change this. Hmm? Look at verse 20. He says, Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's deed, be ye, what does it say? Reconciled to God. Paul is telling the Corinthians, get out of this rut that you're in and get back to being serious with God. Quit playing church and be a Christian. How many of you know what a rut is? That's a grave with both ends kicked out of it. Okay, that's exactly what that is. Learn to enjoy your salvation. Learn and look for an opportunity to sell, tell somebody else about Jesus and see them get saved. There was a fellow that used to go to church with me. Some of you might know him, Brother Jerry Robinette. And we went out door knocking, and we knocked on the door, and, and uh, we just got done with vacation Bible school. And this fellow came to the door, was about 17 years old, and uh, Jerry started uh, talking to him, how did you like vacation Bible school? How did you like the church? Did you learn anything? And then Jerry says, would you like to be saved? And the guy says, yeah, I would. And Jerry immediately started knocking, and he turns to me, and he goes, what do I do now? Now, I could have stole that fish if I don't want to, but I didn't. I backed up, and I said, hey, you know the verses? You lead him to the Lord. And he kind of stumbled through it, but the guy got saved and started coming to church. And if you like a fish, you know how that first fish feels when you pull him out. You couldn't shut Jerry up. If some of you have never led anybody to Christ, let me tell you something. You, it, what, the first time you do it, I'll guarantee you, you'll want to keep going again and again and again. Okay, Jerry showed up 15 minutes before to go out and go sober. He loves to do that. Let me tell you, that's what you need. Don't be one of that 95% that has never led anybody else to Christ. If you don't know how to lead somebody to the Lord, that's the purpose of Sunday school in church. Amen. That's why you've got a pastor here that loves the Lord and Sunday school teachers that can show you how to take a few verses and lead somebody to Christ. Now, I didn't say go out and do this one, two, three, and say a prayer after me. That's not salvation either. Okay, and I don't believe in lordship salvation. I'm not on that trash either. But listen, let me tell you something. Salvation is simple. But you've got to get a person to see that they are a sinner and on their way to hell. Okay? Understand? Amen? Oh me? Okay? Verse 20, 21. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. For he hath made him, that's the Lord Jesus, to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in we need to be going out and doing what the Apostle Paul is doing and pushing Jesus and not pushing ourselves or my church, my pastor. We need to push them to Jesus because Jesus gets a hold of their heart. Their life's going to change. Okay, That's what we're doing in Mongolia. That's what you sent me out to do. That's what I'm doing. Okay, But it, it, it makes my job a lot easier when I know the folks back home are holding the rope Okay, and doing what they're supposed to. Do you remember in the book of Acts when they let Paul down in that, that basket beside the wall? What do you think would have happened to the Apostle Paul if God had cut that rope? I don't think he would have heard about the Lord. Paul would have failed and that would have been the end of it. Okay? We need some folks to hold the rope. Okay? That's why it concerns me sometimes when I don't hear folks from my supporting churches. I don't hear things that are going on. I don't know what's happening. Uh, 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 ben, that's why I like getting notes. Hey, James, how are you doing? This is going on. That's going on. I've got, I got a few churches that do that. Okay? Tell me what they're doing and how they're winning people and starting Bible clubs and vacation Bible school and stuff. Okay? We are here, okay, as a spiritual hospital, not a spiritual museum. We don't come here to show off our finery and say, listen, the some of you young folks, okay, some of the older folks in the congregation are here for your benefit. Use them. Pick their brain. Sit down and, hey, how about this? How about that? That's the reason they're in the church is to help you learn and grow spiritually so that you can go out and be a testimony. Okay? That's why God put him here. Okay? Pick Brother Mitchell's brain. Pick Brother Smith's brain. Sit down and, hey, how about this and how about that? They have been through some things and seen some things and Billy and others that have seen some things that you need to know. You need to learn. They're there to help you. Okay? That's, what, that's the purpose of church. The church is not this building. You're the church. My Bible says the Lord Jesus loved the church enough where he gave himself to the church. Okay? This is important. Let me have every head bowed and every eye closed. I know that there are some folks here that may be struggling with their salvation. Now listen, you could have been in church for 10, 15, 20, 25, 30 years, 
okay, and think that you're saved. But if you got any doubts, why don't you get it settled tonight? Don't go out of here the same way you came in if you've got any doubts about your salvation. Everybody, bow your head, close your eyes. Nobody looking around. I'm not going to pat you on the shoulder. I'm not going to point you out to the pastor. I'm not going to call your name. I'm not asking you to come down to the front or anything else. All I want to do, if you have any doubts about your salvation, is to pray for you. That's all I want to do. If you say, Preacher, I'm not sure I'm saved. I've got some doubts. Would you pray for me? If that's you, would you quickly just slip your hand up and put it right back down? Anybody at all? I see that hand. Anybody else? Preacher, I'm not sure I'm saved, but I'd like to be. Would you pray for me? Anybody else? Quickly. Preacher, I don't know that I'm saved. i got some doubts. I've said that prayer. I'm struggling. I'm going through some things. Would you please pray for me? If that's you, just raise your hand. Put it right back down. Anybody else? Christian, how about you? You've seen some things in your life. You know, you've been playing church and piddling around and not reading your Bible, not praying, not spending time with the Lord, not trying to win somebody to the Lord. If that's you and you need to change some things and you know it, would you raise your hand? Thank you. Thank you. All over. Good. Praise the Lord. Father, you've seen the hands and you know the hearts of every person here tonight. You know who needs what. That one that raised his hand for salvation, I pray you bless him, Lord, help him to come forward tonight. Somebody take the Bible, show him how to be saved. Get that set Lord, for the Christians that have been uh, just playing games, just sitting down and not really taking time with you, not wanting to be a tool, just kind of got their own agenda, but they want to change. I'll pray you a blessing, Lord. Show them what they need to do. Help them to get together with the pastor and some of the others, Lord, to give you a strength and a help to others. Lord, bless us tonight. Help us to be faithful in the things you've called us to do. And we'll thank you for answering prayer in Jesus' name.